الله الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شهور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به وأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أفضل الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم وشر الأمور محتفاتها وكل محتفة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار As far as the sunnah ikhwan and who belongs to it and who doesn't belong to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam we think that this is an appropriate title and an appropriate subject to talk about because of its importance and we after hearing what has to be said and presented insha'Allah from the kitab and the sunnah we have to make it our business the ibnullahi tabaraka wa ta'ala to try to implement and to try to practice these things so that we can be considered from the people of Ahlul Sunnah and not from the people who are not from Ahlul Sunnah so if we're going to talk about the Sunnahs first it's important that we understand some of the definitions of the Sunnah what it is what is it we have different definition for it and you know which definition is intended by why it's being used or how it's being used the first meaning of the sunnah is that the sunnah is the opposite of the buddha of the innovation the person says this is the sunnah and that is the innovation after you pray salat al-zuhur to start to make the dhikr with your anamil subhanallah 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 that's from the sunnah to make the adhkar that the prophet left for us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that's from the sunnah and after making salat al dhuhr to start shaking hands with each other and to say to one another taqabbal allah minni wa minkum and to raise our hands and to wipe our faces to raise our hands and making the dua all the time this is not from the sunnah but that's the dua so that's the first meaning of the sunnah you know that this is being talked about depending upon how it's being, being used the second meaning of the sunnah is that which is not obligatory to fast in the month of Ramadan is wajib or fard and to fast on Mondays and Thursdays from your own self and your own desire is the sunnah so that's a fast that is from the sunnah so that the dhuhr is fard or is wajib and to pray what is before or after it is the sunnah but it's not an obligation upon you so that's the second meaning but it's the opposite of what is obligatory the third meaning of the sunnah insha'Allah ta'ala is that it is that which is wajib like leaving the beard is the sunnah but it's not that type of sunnah that you have been afforded the opportunity to leave it alone no it's an obligation so many times people make the mistake of reading some, some of the statements of the ulama or hearing some of the statements of the ulama and they misunderstand them. they say you know like keeping the beard is the sunnah and they think that it means you can cut your beard and that's just an example from many examples so there are those things from the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam that are 
obligations upon us. And the fourth and final definition that we want to do with here today is that the sunnah is the minhaj and the aqidah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The minhaj or the way that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went about doing things. When the Prophet came alayhi salatu wa salam and he started to give dawah to Allah ta'ala and he wanted to change the condition of the people. What did he begin with? That's the sunnah. To begin with teaching the people about the concept of the tawheed of Allah Ta'ala. Taking out of their minds foreign concepts. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam came to the people and he wanted to change the political system and the economical system, did he say to Abu Lahab and to Abu Jahl, Qatalahum Allah, Wa La'anahum Allah, did he say to them, hey, let me be a part of your parliament, a part of your program, so that we can change this way? When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and he wanted to establish an Islam, did he kidnap people? Stab people who are def- defenseless, blow up people. So the sunnah is the minhaj and the aqidah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. To believe in Allah ta'ala the way that he has legislated you to believe in his names and his characteristics. As far as this point is concerned, we find that the scholars of Islam, they used to write those books. Like the book Sharh al-Sunnah. To Al Imam Al Barbahari, Sharh al Sunnah, the explanation of the Sunnah. It's not talking about those first three minutes that we gave, the explanation of what is Rajat, the explanation of what is the Sunnah, not the Bid'ah, the explanation of what is from the Sunnah, and it's not Farouk. No. That book, Sharh al Sunnah, is talking about the Aqidah and the Minhaj of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Ali Wa Sallam. Kitab al Sunnah, to Al Imam. Ibn Abi Asim, the same thing. Kitab al-Sunnah or Usul al-Sunnah to Al-Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Usul al-Sunnah, in which he said, and they described it or they translated it as the fundamentals of the Sunnah, I believe that's how it's translated. The foundations of what? A faith of the Sunnah. رسول سنة عندنا تمسك بما كان عليه أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والاقتداء بهم وترك البدع فإن كل بدعة ضلالة وترك الخصومات في الدين He started off كتاب رسول سنة The fundamentals of the sunna What is it? The very first fundamental of the sunna is holding on to what the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم held on to from the minhaj, from the aqidah. Holding on to what the companions of the Prophet held on to, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and following them, and leaving along all bid'ah in the religion. For verily every bid'ah is going astray. And leaving along arguing and vain discussions. And he went on to give so many examples. Those are the definitions and the meanings of the Sunnah when you see them as they relate to the Islamic religious texts. Now we want to get to who are the people from the Sunnah. Before talking about who are the people from the Sunnah, you know things by their opposites. You know that now the night time is the night time because the daytime defines it as being night. You know the truth is the truth, and once you know the truth, you can define and understand what is bothered, what is false. If we're going to talk about the people of the Sunnah, I think it's appropriate that we first talk about who's not from the Sunnah. And we're going to talk about who's not from the Sunnah based upon the ayat of the Quran that my brother Abu Qutub, Jazahullah Khaira, and I were reading a few minutes ago. And that's the statement of Allah Ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran. When he talked about Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam and the da'wah of Ibrahim. When he said, ma kana Ibrahim yahudiya wala nasraniya wala kin kana hanifan muslima wa ma kana min al-mushrikeen. Inna awla al-nasi bi Ibrahima lalladhina attabu'uhu wa hadha al-nabi wa lalladhina amanu wa allahu wa liyum u'neen. 
Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, and before giving the translation, I want to make this point because we heard it a few times. It is a grave mistake for the brothers who are learning to give khutbahs or give classes. Whenever you want to make the istishhad or you want to make a proof from the Quran, it is a grave mistake to say, as Allah said in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min shaitan ar-rajim, and then you read the ayah. Because Allah Ta'ala didn't say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan ar-rajim. The time that we say that is, before you're going to sit down, you're going to read the Quran with the tartil, and you're going to read the Quran to get close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But at this time, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his sunnah was, whenever he wanted to say an ayah to his companions, he would just say, what you hear Allah say, and you will read the ayah. As Allah said, and you will read the ayah. He wouldn't say, Do you hear Allah say, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, inna ad-deena indallah al-islam. So we can't change what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and we can't say that he said what he didn't say. So in this ayah that we mentioned, Allah ta'ala said, Verily Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wa salam, one of the major, this is my word, he's one of the major prophets of our Islam. Verily Ibrahim, he wasn't a Jew, nor was he a Christian, but instead he was Hanif and he was a Muslim. He was upright and he was a Muahid. He was a Hanif, upright and he was a Muahid. He established the Tawheed of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. And he was not from the Mushrikeen. Verily those people who have more rights. Inna awla nasi bi Ibrahima. Those people have more rights to connect themselves to Ibrahim. To be considered followers of Ibrahim. Layyadina tabu'uhu are those people who followed Ibrahim, who followed the dictates and the dis- instructions and the encouragements and the orders of Ibrahim. They left alone what Ibrahim told them to leave alone. He told them to do this and to do that, they followed him. Leave this alone, then leave that alone, they left it alone. They're the ones who have the most right to be connected to Ibrahim. Those people who followed him were Hazan Nabi. And this Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Ali Wasallam, Walladina Amanu, and those people who believe with him and in him, meaning the companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the people of this Ummah. And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala will answer in the ayah by saying, And Allah is the wali of the mu'mineen. Allah is the one who is responsible for the mu'mineen. He is the protector and he is the friend, insha'Allah Ta'ala, of those who believe. So this ayah of the Qur'an is a very important ayah because we're going to use it as the measurement that we're going to measure. And we're going to make qiyas from this ayah or analogy. And you all know what qiyas is. It's one of the masadir of the tashri' that allows something to be known as being halal or haram. That you make the analogy. You have a ruling about something, and then you don't have a ruling about something else. So because of the similar properties and the similarities between the two things, they take the same ruling. If Allah Ta'ala negated that Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, he wasn't a Yehudi, nor was he a Nasrani. And he established in the Qur'an who are the followers of Ibrahim. We can take this same principle and this same ayah and connect it to the Sunnah and Ahl Sunnah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And we can say, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ حَنَفِيًّا وَلَا شَافِعِيًّا ولا حنبليا ولا مالكيا ولا معتدلا ولا أشعريا ولا رافضيا ولا كلابيا ولا أقلانيا ولا سوفيا إلى آخره محمد wasn't any of these things he wasn't تبليغيا أنا أخوانيا we can take that same ayat all the way about Ibrahim and apply it here. That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wasn't none of these things that the people create after him. But instead, he was the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, his messenger, his prophet, and the example for those who believe. And the people who have the most right to connect themselves to him, لَلَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ Are those people who follow him. Now we take our mothers 
and our fathers and our sisters for the brothers and the sisters who have reverted back to al Islam. And our relatives claim a connection to Ibrahim and they claim a connection to Isa ibn Maryam alayhim as salatu was salam wa ala nabiyyina as salatu was salam they make a claim if they stood in the middle of the street or on the top of, on the top of the highest mountain on top of their head screaming with the highest voice that they can muster that they are connected to Ibrahim Wallahi their statements don't mean anything because when you look at their actions and what they believe it has no connection to what Ibrahim brought alayhi salatu wasalam and no one is going to sit there and give them the time of day to try to convince him as a Muslim that they are connected to Isa ibn Maryam as long as they say that Isa is the son of Allah we won't even give them the time of day because it doesn't make sense we'll spend our time trying to explain to them how that's ludicrous and it's impossible similarly the same holds true for the Muslim who wants to stand on top of his head and be on other than the sunnah and follow other than the will of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam if he stands on top of the mountain with a bullhorn with a microphone on top of his head in the middle of the street in the most busy intersection in the city his statements don't have any weight to them by virtue of the fact that he is not of those people who follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so who are those people who claim to be from Ahlul Sunnah but they're not from the Sunnah there are a number of people the first group of people are those people who have forsaken the Sunnah verbally and in public or in their heart they have an aversion to the Sunnah and they forsook the Sunnah you all know that the proof of this is the famous Hadith of those three companions mind you the three companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al ladina radhi allahu anhum wa radhu an those three companions who went to the house of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they subsequently visited a number of his wives and they asked them about the ibadat of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and when they were informed as to how he was a normal man how his ibadah was ma'qul it was it's ma'qul hmm? possible it's ma'qul ya akhi reasonable he didn't do things that were unreasonable as a human being when they heard what they had to say and they looked at it and they weighed their hamas and their desire and their, what they wanted to do the, the hadith said فَتَقَالُوهَا they looked at the actions of what they were told about as being small and few like we can do more than that now when they opened up that door they opened up the door of destruction on themselves hey I can do more than what the prophet was doing as I heard when I first came to Al-Islam with a guy who I had a lot of respect for him at the time who was with the American Muslim mission he told me it's possible that a human being that a Muslim can surpass Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in taqwa in understanding he said that out of ignorance of course but when you open that door wallahi you open on yourself the door of destruction how is Allah Ta'ala going to send a prophet or a messenger as an example to be followed and yet the other people can surpass him doesn't make any sense it's contrary to what is ma'qul to what is reasonable they looked at those statements as being small those actions so you know the hadith the long hadith I'm going to pray I'm not going to go to sleep and as for me I'm going to fast all the time and the other one said and I'm not going to marry women I'm going to stay from, away from the women especially in light of the fact that they're a big fitna they're a big fitna because of the shawa connected to them they're a big fitna because you have to be responsible for them they don't want to listen you can't get along with them can't live with them can't live without them I'm going to stay away from them they take me away from the zikr of Allah tabarak ta'ala that was their statement Ya Allah ta'ala when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam found out and heard about what they were saying and he wanted to give the tawjih and the irshad to this particular situation he told them I get 
I fast and I break my fast, I pray and I go to sleep and I marry the women. And then here's the point. Those people who forsake the sunnah, he went on to say, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّةِ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي So those people who forsake my sunnah, they're not for me. Those people who forsake it intentionally, in their heart, in their near ears, I don't like that thing. I don't like the hijab or the jilbab or the lihya. I don't like believing in the asma of Allah and the sifat of Allah tabarak ta'ala. I don't like that I have to obey the man in leadership, meaning the khila, the khalifa or the hakim. Instead, those rulers I have a problem with it. I'm going to revolt against those rulers. I have a problem, the woman says, with having to obey my husband that he has that upper hand over me. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with poor marriage. Anyone who says that with his tongue and he feels it in his heart, he has for some the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he's not from Ahl sunnah what about the people who have an aversion and they don't realize it they have an aversion based upon ignorance wallahi this hadith is applicable to them because those companions we can't possibly fathom the thought that they intentionally wanted to leave the sunnah they wanted to get close to Allah with Allah, but they wanted to get close to Allah with that which was not legislated. So if the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his companions, those people who are pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with them, he said to them, and they are in paradise, whoever forsakes my sunnah is not for me, then how does that correspond and connect to the people after them? The people who don't know if Allah is pleased with them or not. So those are the first group of people who are not connected to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And for this reason, Ikhwan, before we move on to the third or the second point, I want to give a special recognition and a special tanbih to this issue. And that is, one of the things that we've seen over and over again is how the people who are trying to be of the sunnah and from the sunnah many times we make people have aversions to the sunnah by the way we give them dawah so they have a problem with this differentiating between the sunnah and your behavior between the sunnah and your behavior and then we'll take this concept that we're trying to relate to your minds and to your hearts right now and we say to that person you are not from the sunnah you hate the sunnah you have the people who don't like the sunnah no instead the da'i the one who's giving him da'wah he's a person who is a fitna in the way of the sunnah he is preventing the people from the way of the sunnah so the last thing that we want to do is or what we should want to do, the last thing that we should want to do is make the people go astray and reject the good because of our behavior. Because wallahi, I don't believe that anyone who has his right mind and his senses is presented with the truth in a nice, palatable fashion, I don't think that the majority of the people of this ummah are going to reject it. It's the way the people present it. So that's the first group of people. The second group of people do, who are not from the sunnah are those people who fall into certain crimes and sins, ma'asi and mukhalafat that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam defined as taking you off of the sunnah in his way. There are certain things from the crimes and the mistakes that the Muslim can make that will take him off of the sunnah. Before getting to those things, we have to understand the nature of the human being is that he's going to make mistakes. The men and the women. All of the human beings, without an exception, كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمْ خَطَّاءُونَ وَخَيْرُ خَطَّاءُونَ التَّوَابُونَ All of the sons of Adam, every single one of them, without any exception, they make mistakes, they sin. And the best ones who make these mistakes are the ones who repent right afterwards. Like the prophets and the messengers. You won't find them 
making a mistake in the Quran except an ayah or two ayahs after the mistake that you've been told about you see them making a istighfar wherever you see an ayah in the Quran where a prophet or a messenger made a mistake right after that they will make the istighfar so everyone is prone to making mistakes مَا مِنْ عَبْدٍ إِلَّا وَلَهُ ذَنْبٌ هُوَ يَعْتَادُهُ أَلْفِينَةَ بَعْدِ الْفِينَةَ أو ذنب هو مقيم عليه لا يفارقه حتى يفارق الدنيا إن المؤمن خلق مفتنا توابا نسيا إذا ذكر مطر there is not a عبد there is not a servant except that each and every one of them they have a sin that they always do from time to time they do these sins from time to time every single person or he does a sin that he's always doing it he'll never leave that sin until he dies and leaves this dunya but the believer has been created to be mustoon he's going to be subjugated to being trying falling into sins making mistakes and the believer has been created to make toba and he's been created to forget he forgets but the believer is the one who if he is reminded he remembers if you remind him he remembers so we sukna kulla hadha ilaykum we said all of this in order for you just to understand everyone's going to make a mistake but there are certain types of mistakes if we fall into them we run the risk of not being of the people of Ahl Sunnah like what? like the hadith of the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who's not very well known his name is Ruwaysa Ibn Thabit رضي الله تعالى عنه رويس ابن ثابت رضي الله عنه he said that the prophet says صلى الله عليه وسلم يا رويس لعل الحياة ستطول بك بعدي فأخبر الناس أنه من عقد لحيته أو تقلت وطرة أو استنجى برضيء برجيع دابة فإن محمد بريء منه أو ويفع I'm going to tell you just like I told the rest of my companions who I used to think maybe they were going to live a long time and I wanted to give you a wasiyah and some nasiha when I'm not on the scene I'm going to tell you this information a wasiyah it may be that you're going to live a long time after me I'll die and you're still living if that happens Ruwaysa I want you to tell the people whoever braids his beard he twists up and he does it like that and whoever ties a whipper he puts on his hand those tamaim he wraps around his arm he puts a horseshoe over the door he puts his keys on a rabbit's foot he ties in his car one of those Quranic ayat Subhanallahi Sakhara Lana Hada and he thinks that that paper is going to protect him whoever does this and he makes istinja with the dung the dry dung of an animal tell them the way he said that Muhammad is free from them they're not from they're not from me I'm free of those people now if we look at these issues Ikhwan these three issues what's the big thing about tying up your beard what's the big thing about tying up your beard I can see the tamima the tamaim is shirk and kufr but what's the big thing about tying up your beard what's the big major thing about making this stinja with the dung of the animals because it's the food of our brothers from the jinn what's the big deal we don't understand what the big deal is that's what the prophet says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we submit but it goes to show us an important issue and that is the people who want to make us think as people who are coming back to the religion trying to make Islam a reality in our lives we embrace Islam and when you open your eyes you see all of these groups and all of these different da'awah da'awah different calls different ways everyone is saying al-haq ma'i ta'al 
Al Haq Ma'i Ta'al. Everyone is saying the same thing when you open your eye as a new Muslim. There are a group of people who say, listen, look, we have to overlook these issues that are baby issues, these small issues, and we have to establish the major issues like the Baytul Mal of the Muslims, and we have to establish the Khilafah of the Muslims, and we have to establish the Jihad against the Kufar, and we have to establish all of these major issues, Al Hudud. I will lie, all of these things are from Islam and they're important. But when we look at the hadith of Ruwaysi, we understand from this hadith that there is nothing small in our religion. In El Islam, there is nothing that is small. We agree and we accept, and we have to always remember this, that there are priorities and there are things that we can overlook. There are secondary issues. There are things that are primary that you have to take care of. No doubt about that. Everyone understands that. But to minimize the other aspects and the people minimize them because they don't want to be from Ahl Sunnah. It's not because they say for the sake of the Dawah, no. It's because they have an aversion to being Muqayyadun, being... What is Taqiyid, Akhi? To be restricted. They don't want to be restricted by the religion. The religion says to us, for an example, no, you can't worship Allah the way you want to worship Allah. You can't go about getting married the way you want to get married. You can't give dawah the way you want to give, give dawah. So the people say, let's leave these issues alone because they divide the people. They don't say that because they really want to bring people's hearts together. No, it's because they don't want to be restricted by the religion. So this hadith of Ruwaysa, twisting up that beard is not a big issue, and yet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam freed himself from the people who do it. And the other hadith that you're all aware of that took place with Abu Sulaiman, Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam sent him out as the leader of the Sharia, and Khalid on the expedition killed those people because up until that point he didn't know the ruling so they were enemies to the state of Al-Islam he's at the head of the army and he just dealt with them men and women and some children when the prophet came by and he saw what Khalid manufactured the prophet alayhi salatu salam at that point being a person who no evil can ever take place in his presence except he has to put it right. If he allows it to go unspoken about, then it is from the sunnah. Anything that happens in his presence and he doesn't say anything about it, he gives his consent, it's from the sunnah. So it's impossible for us to accept the dawah or the argument. Maybe the prophet, he allowed it in his presence and it didn't happen, some of the people say. Maybe this thing, the khalwa, as we heard a guy say, maybe, maybe there was a time when he allowed it to happen. No, it's not, it's impossible. Impossible. It would have been related to us. When he saw what Khalid did, he freed himself from the action. Allahumma inni bari'u mimma sana'a Khalid. Oh Allah, I am free of what Khalid produced right here, what he did. So those people who want to consider themselves from the people of the Sunnah, and they do actions like this, blow people up, take people hostage, kill people, chop them up, go on a bus and randomly blow people up. Nah, we say that those people are not from the people of Ahl Sunnah. That's the second group of people. Those people who fall into certain ma'asi and certain makhalafat, that the Prophet established these people are not from, he, these are the people who I have freed myself from. The third group of people, the third group of people, Ikhwan, are the people who fall into deviation. The people who fall into the danger of creating and inventing in the religion of Al-Islam. Even though their niya is pure and is correct and they want to get close to Allah Ta'ala, unfortunately, you can't consider yourself from the people of the Sunnah if you're working contrary to what the Sunnah is about. When you innovate and you participate in innovation, 
you are in essence saying I'm against the sunnah I'm against what the Prophet brought Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I don't see it as being enough for me and this sin of as bid'a shaitan he loves it more than he loves the people who fall into the ma'asi the people who fall into crime their sins shaitan loves the mubtadi more than him there's not a Muslim man that you know who's selling pork khinzir or khamar who's not praying she's not wearing the hijab if you go to that person in a nice way and you say to that person in a nice way and you don't agitate them and make them from the mutakabbirin you say to them ya akhi this thing that you're doing is against Islam he'll say ya akhi Allah li make dua for me inshallah I'm going to try to get it right even if he's just making a tamashi he's just pushing you along yeah. but he'll recognize he's making a mistake the one who's doing a sin ya akhi you make a zina like that have a lot of you have a haram كبيرة من الكبائر he'll say أخي make dua for me almost unanimously this is going to be the response of the Muslims when you bring it to them the right way Shaitani knows that whereas the Muqtabi Kalla that's not his case you come and you tell him to pray this Salat Salat al-Raghaib on the first Friday of Rajat where you pray 12 Raka'at in each Raka'at you read Qul Hu Allahu Ahad and you read Surah Al-Qadr Inna Anzallahu Fiyu Al-Qadr you read these two hours of Surah and every Surah is every Raka'at he's not going to leave it alone the 27th of Ramadan bring in the cake, the cookies, the peanuts, the soda to the master as they do recently we had the celebration of Al-Isra and Miraj that we don't even know when it happened but they choose it for the 27th day of Rajab the birthday of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam any form of Buddha that you know about people do it because they want to get close to Allah when you come to them and you say to them Ya Akhi this Salat Salat al Raghaib in the month of Rajab you can't pray that Salat he read to you, Ara'ayta al-ladhi yanha abdun nida salla. Have you not seen the one who prevents the abd from praying when he wants to pray? How are you going to stop me from praying again close to Allah? Tabarak wa ta'ala how? Ya akhi, no one is trying to stop you from praying to Allah. We're saying to you though, pray to Allah with wudu. Pray to Allah facing the qibla. Pray to Allah with your aura covered. Pray to Allah with the salat time being in. Pray to Allah Ta'ala and there is no najasa around you la akhiri Pray to Allah with the conditions of the salah Worship Allah Ta'ala with the conditions of the ibadah With sincerity and with that which Allah Ta'ala has legislated for you What's the proof that the people of Bid'a are not from Ahl sunnah Because this question came so many times How do we do with the Imam from Ahl al-Bid'a? Are the people of Ahl al-Bid'a from the sunnah? Sheikh Shakir, remind me, inshallah, to mention the first question that we're going to entertain is the issue about the, and, and this ummah is going to break up into 73 sects, all of them in the hellfire except one. Remind me that. First question. These questions used to come to us over and over. We used to see them being presented. We never got around to them. What's the proof? Are the sunnah, are the ahlul bid'ah from them or not? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam told us about the long hadith about what's going to happen at his kofar at his hawb his fountain that fountain who has vessels more than the vessels more than the number of the stars in the sky the milk of it is so white and so pure and the honey is so nice whoever drinks he's never going to get thirsty again he told us about that long hadith of what's going to happen how Allah Ta'ala is going to raise all of the people up barefooted, naked and uncircumcised and the first one who's going to be clothed is who? who's the first Bani Adam who's going to have clothes put on him Allah. who's the first son of Adam who's going to be clothed Yom Qiyamah Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam Who's the first son of the sons of Adam 
when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the first one to awake from the home when it's blown. Gee, mashallah. And to ulama ya akhi, tahjumun alayya. And to hujum, I mean, just come right out. In the hadith of Ibrahim, the Prophet said Ibrahim would be the first one who would be called. A lot of beautiful points and messages in that hadith. The point that we want to deal with here is when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to see people from his community being taken from the left side, getting ready to be thrown into the hellfire, he's going to try to step forward to make the shafa for them. To intercede for them. And he's going to intercede for almost everybody in this ummah. Almost everyone will get the opportunity, opportunity to have his intercession. He has different types of intercession. The greatest intercession. He'll step forward and he'll say, Ashabi, Ashabi. Don't throw them in the hellfire. Those are my followers. Not my companions. My followers from my community. Those people believe in me and they follow me. They're Muslim. They fast in Ramadan. They know Salah. They say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. They're Muslim. They wear swords. And then it will be said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, Inna ka la ta'lam ma ahdathu ba'dik. You don't know what they created and introduced after you, Ya Muhammad. You don't know how these people introduced something in their religion. That when people embraced Islam, they embraced what was created thinking it was a religion. And they worshiped Allah Ta'ala based upon that deviance that wasn't legislated. Children were born in Islam and raised in Islam, seeing their parents doing certain things on the 27th of Ramadan and Rajat and all of this. They think it's religion. And they embraced it. And they were worshiping Allah Ta'ala without any benefit, making shirk with Allah Ta'ala. Wallahi shaitan he loves that more than anything else So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam Upon hearing that statement He says to those people, to those malaika To those people who are going to be thrown away Get them away from me Get them away from me They're not from my sunnah They didn't drink from the fountain of the sunnah in the dunya They didn't come to know about it they didn't drink from the fountain of the sunnah in the dunya. They won't drink of the fountain of the sunnah in the hereafter. That's one of their punishments. You can't partake in this hold. No water for you, no drink for you. Back up. You innovated in the religion. You participated in deviance in the religion. Those are some of the people who are not from the sunnah. As for the people who are from the people of the sunnah, clearly, as Sheikh Abu Usama al Kabir Salim al Hilali spoke about the Ghuraba and the descriptions that he gave about the Ghuraba, that number one, they are the people who yatamasakuna bil Islam. Number two, in the hadith, they say, Qawmun Salihun, Khalil. They are Salihun, and he went on to explain that the Salihun were who? Who were the Salihun? But what, the, what was the point he proved from that? He was given the characteristics of the Ghuraba. The first one he said, يَتَمَسَّكُنَا Islam. They hold on to Islam. And then he said, number two, they are farihun, and he took from that a very important point. What did he say? What, Akhi? That's part of it. You mean to tell me no, not a single Laysafikum Rajul Rashid, not one person remember that? He said that the Salih, this is proof that they do what? Ya'amaluna bil Islam. They do the actions. They work by that which they have. He said you can't be Salih without the actions. And he went through all of those ayat and ahadith to prove to that. Allah says over and over in the Quran, Alladina Amanu Alladina, Alladina Amanu Alladina, Amal Salih had so many examples how in order to be Salih it has to be coupled with actions you can't call a man Salih who's not working you guys forgot that huh maybe that's one of the reasons why we inshallah have Iman without that many actions that was an important point Wallahi 
So all of that, you go back to what you wrote down in that class, and it's not something that we have to repeat again. He hit the nail on the head, and I thought that was a very beneficial class because it was minhaji. It wasn't a class of entertainment. It was a class of minhaji that if you get the tape, if you didn't write it down, get the tape and listen to it again because what he pulled out, it was important. So now we're going to entertain, inshallah, the questions for a few minutes. As far as the 73 sex of Khan, you ought to pay attention to this so we don't be of the people who put people out. To that thing, and he's a Muslim. He falls into that crime or that sin. And he dies in Al Islam, on Al Islam, with the kalima to Tawheed in his heart. No matter what he did or what he didn't do. If he dies with a Tawheed in his heart, the way you understand those texts of the Wa'id is that the person who does that is Tahta Mashi'atullahi Ta'ala. Insha'a Azzabahu wa insha'a Afa'anu wa Ghafara Lahu. Tahta Mashi'a. وَلَا يَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ Those people from this ummah who fall into those mistakes, if Allah chooses, Allah will forgive them, overlook what they did, change their bad deeds into good deeds, if He chooses, He'll overlook them. And if He chooses, He'll punish them. If He dies, He'll tell His family. So those groups, from this Ummah when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said وَسَتَفْتَرِقُ أُمَّتِي and my Ummah is going to break up into 73 sects he said they were from his Ummah all of them will be in the hellfire except one of them all of them will be rejected and all of the people who are upon those other 72 sects if Allah chooses, they'll go to the hellfire. If He chooses, He'll forgive them and they won't go to the hellfire. And if they go to the hellfire, they're not going to stand the fire forever. They're going to be from the Jahannami Yun. Those people go get burnt to get purified to go into the paradise. But we don't understand from this hadith, as many of the questions, how we understood people thought that they were kuffar. When Ali, radiallahu anhu, was asked about the Shiite or the Khawarij specifically who were fighting against him who were making takfir against him and the other companions who clearly rejected the Quran and the Hadith how are you going to fight Ali and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he was in paradise and he married him to his duck and he raised him in the house of prophecy how are you going to fight these other people? Clearly, the haq was with Ali. Anyway, the people came to Ali radiallahu anhu to ask him, those khawarij, you see those people who are fighting you right now and revolting against you? Clearly, they're not listening to the Quran. Clearly, they're not following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by revolting and making taqsir like this. They're kufar, aren't they? Aren't they not Muslims? Aren't they outside of the fold of Islam? Ali radiallahu anhu responded with Adam. Even though they're his enemies, the enmity between him and them didn't cause him to say, no, they're kufar. No. And the sunnah of people were just. He said, men al kufri farru. They're trying to run away from disbelief. They're doing what they're doing because they're trying to run away from disbelief. They just have their shubahat and their shahwa. But those people, the reason why they're doing this is that they're trying to not fall into what is wrong. Judging by other than what Allah Ta'ala revealed in the akhiri. And that brings us to another important point and that is anytime people try to run away from something of Ahlul Sunnah, they always run into that which is worse. You try to run away from something and you leave the sunnah, you run into that which is worse. Those people who say, No, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala la yatakallam. Allah Ta'ala la yastahi. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala la yanzil. 
These things can't be applied to Allah. They're not applicable. He's not shy. He doesn't speak. He doesn't come down. He doesn't have a foot. He doesn't have a hand. He doesn't have a shin. Why? Because if he had all of this, he's like a human being. He has a body. So they tried to run away from describing a body to Allah. And what did they fall into? They fall into making the ta'atil of Allah's characteristics. If Allah doesn't do all of this and He's not like this in a way that's befitting His majesty, if He's not like that and you deny it, then what are you worshiping? Nothing. Zero. So you try to run away from this and you fall into that. The people want to judge by that which Allah revealed. That's beautiful. Everyone wants to do that. But we have to do it the way that the Prophet Sallallahu explained to the people. So instead of holding on to that, they run away from them. They fall into making takfir of the Muslims. All of them. So they wind up giving dawah to the rabbits and to the bears in the forest by themselves. Because ultimately they're going to make takfir of everyone, even themselves. Now you think if a man is going to make takfir of his mother because she doesn't wear hijab, that he's not going to make takfir of you? He's going to make takfir of you as soon as you don't make takfir of someone who he sees as a kafir. He sees Nasr al-Din al-Albani as a kafir. And if you don't see him as a kafir, you're a kafir. Why? Because whoever doesn't make the takfir of a kafir, and he's a kafir. I got to make takfir. And you see, this is a bunch of rhetoric. So my advice to those brothers who reverted back to Islam and they're embracing this dawah, let us hold on to those books as we say all the time, like the book Sharh al-Sunnah to al-Imam al-Barbahari and before that, the book Usul al-Sunnah to al-Imam Ahmed. The Imam who stood up and defended the Sunnah. I can't stress this enough, Ikhwan. There are certain ayat of the Qur'an we should learn, we should memorize. We should have them in our hands and in our hearts. And there are certain ahadith that we should familiarize ourselves with. Like the ahadith that our sheikh and our brother, Abu al-Harith Ali al halidi wrote, called the 40 hadith of... No. No. The call and the caller. The Islamic personality is good as well. But the other one, the call and the caller. Those hadith we shall come to know about insha'Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. The statement nan tamassuna naru illa ayyam ma'duda there's no problem here because that's the statement of the Yahud that came as a result of the Aqidah that's Ta'bana and anybody who has a bad Aqidah is going to affect his Saluk it's going to affect his Akhlaq they think and thought I can do whatever I want to do yes I want to kill Rasulullah even though the Prophet says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam inna ashad al-nas adhab yawmu qiyama rajulun Qatala nabiyan aw qatalahu nabi. The worst punishment that the man gonna get, Yawmul Qiyam is the man who killed the Prophet or a Prophet killed him. Because he was trying to extinguish the light of Allah. He was trying to kill a Prophet, so he killed him. And he, can you imagine that? I don't know what Allah gonna do with that person, Yawmul Qiyam. He stood before the Prophet and the Messenger, Zakaria, killed him. Tried to kill Isa ibn Maryam, those Yahud. Or the Prophet killed him. Now you know the Prophet is not going to kill anyone except defending the Haq. Except trying to defend himself. So now those Jews said, look, we're going to try to kill Muhammad, throw a rock on him, kill him, let the Kufa in the back door at the battle, battle of the Khandaq, do whatever we can, get rid of him. We're going to hide the truth, we're going to make people go astray. You read that Torah of theirs that is Munharaf changed. They have all those crazy concepts that you can do this to the Gentile. You can do so many things to the Gentile. You get some meat that's no good, don't sell it to your brother Jew, sell it to the Gentile. You can take his wife and all that kind of stuff. You know, so this is the aqidah that's what. Do whatever you want. Why? Forty days, the, the fire is going to get us. After that, we're going to be in charge of the Jannah. So it's no problem. That's the statement of the Yahud, and it's not the statement of 
the people of Al Islam and it's a hikayah that Allah was telling us about them. And that hadith is connected to it of the Jews breaking off into seventy one sects, all of them in the hellfire except one. The Christians breaking off into seventy two sects, all of them in the hellfire except one. And this Ummah is gonna break off into three sects, all of them in the hellfire except one. So those Jews and those Christians they had Ahl al-Sunnah wal jamaah from their Anbiya as well. And you know that's so authentic as, you know, the Sheikh. Naam, Akhi. Seventy-three, Naam. Any more questions, Ikhwan? At Fadbal. There was a word that you've used, alhamdulillah, ma'qool. For extreme. For extreme? Uh, no. No, I think we said reasonable. Reasonable. No. Okay. Uh, and this ma'qul also, another question came up as to the new Muslim sister asked the question, why? Why? Why is the Muslim, why is the baby girl's urine pushed? No. You just. No. You just. You have to clean it. It's najasa, it's najis, and the urine of the baby boy, Kuramukumullah, is not najis. We have answered that question before, but there is something else that the word ma'qul was used here as well, and that's other than reasonable. It doesn't mean reasonable here, and that shows you the richness of the language, and that is in our Islam we have, as the scholars have divided the ahkam, or the legislation of Allah, into two parts. Those legislations, why we do things, and they call it ma'qul al mana and those things that have been legislated that are ghayru ma'qul al mana We know why Allah legislated this. There are certain things we know why Allah legislated, and then there are other things we don't know why Allah Taala legislated those things. We know why Allah Taala legislated the tahrim of khamar. We know why Allah Ta'ala legislated the tahrim of the tabarraj for the nisa. We know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated the qawama to be with the rijal. We know why Allah Ta'ala legislated why you should marry a mushrik a woman as a Muslim man. But we don't know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated salatul fajr to be prayed like this and do an asim maghrib isha. We don't know why we have to uh, go around the Kaaba this way or that way. We don't know why we have to give this much money from our zakat. Why Ramadan is in this month. Why this and that and that. We don't know those things. So, ma'qul here has another meaning. The, subhanAllah, I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. No, no, I wasn't listening. No, 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 I'm mentioning the microphone. Oh. Uh, the question was, is that in the hadith with regards to the three men that asked about certain character traits of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they said those things, uh, this was my understanding in which the word ma'qul was used. Hence, the question uh, that is raised, insha'Allah, is uh, the enrollment as parents of our children into the city public schools, whereby the intrinsic aspects of the curriculum have hidden tendencies that are very extreme that rejects many of the aspects of our tenets of aqidah. Right, what about it? Should we enroll our children in public school? Yeah. Especially as they get older. <laughs> as they get older. The brother here, Hamid Muhammad, Fumbun. As for the people who claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a son from the Muslims, it should increase our iman from the truthfulness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who told us that we were going to follow the Jews and the Christians. 
a hair spun by hair spun, an arm spun by arm spun, till if they went into the hole of the lizard, we were going to follow them in every aspect. Even in those crazy statements and ideas like that. There are those people who say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam is created from the nur of Allah ta'ala. He has the essence of Allah in him. Ali radiallahu anhu is Allah. He is Allah. So if people from this ummah fall into following them in this issue, in the most important principle of Islam, then everything else, hadith wala haraj. So that concept that Allah has a son and he's Ali or Ali is Allah is kufr, disbelief. But we're not going to take that person outside of the religion until we sit that person down and we let the people of knowledge talk to him, establish upon him the hujjah, the hujjah, and then let them determine is that person a Muslim or a non-Muslim. That is a concept that is kufr. And it's from what we call, or the scholars of Islam call, what is known from the religion with the durura. It's something that is known in the religion, just everyone knows it. The Bedouin, the al ummi the illiterate person, the woman, the Arab, the non-Arab, the Persian Chinese, Everyone in Islam knows that Allah Ta'ala doesn't have signs and He doesn't know. It's too many ayat of the Qur'an. Too many examples of how Islam came to wash away those crazy concepts and ideas. But the strange thing is that the sons of Adam, some of them are just crazy. They embrace that which doesn't make any sense. It's not ma'qul. So it's a disbelieving statement, but we don't say that people who do that are disbelievers until we know the Aqidah. Like the people in Syria who are called the Nusayriya, the Aqidah is outside of the fold of Al-Islam. Before we take the two questions over here, inshallah, I just would like to read one of the uh, written questions that came up from the sister, inshallah. There's a question here that we have. It says, uh, I would like to wear the niqab. My husband... Uh, my husband is afraid of the way the kufa will react, will react to it, so he doesn't permit me to wear it. I don't understand the question. If the sister wants to wear the niqab and the husband doesn't want her to wear the niqab, inshallah, she should obey her husband if she can't convince him and his reasons if they are, he came to that conclusion based upon evidences and based upon study and what he really feels is not because of some weakness in his personality or weakness in his uh, application for that but so he is not obligatory inshallah even though as our sister she's my sister she our sister we all would encourage that sister you know like we would encourage our wives and daughters and sisters to wear the niqab and that brother we would take that brother to the side and say Ahi, what are you doing and we encourage him to encourage his wife. How many brothers are married to women who they don't respect and they don't obey them? I can't see how a man is going to be married to a woman who wants to be the man in the relationship. She wants to be the boss. She speaks tough. She doesn't make an attempt to try to be an obedient wife. How are you going to be married to a woman like that? So if we have some brothers, you look at them, unfortunately they are tried with situations where they have women who they can't say to them look I want you to wear the hijab they go without any Islamic clothing they have children by them so they have to be patient they don't want to destroy their families and they are in a bind it's not that they're weak all the time it's not that they're weak circumstances came about like that wrongly or rightly that's not the issue circumstances came about like that so now he tries to encourage his wife to put on the hijab, but he's having a tough time. Here, this brother has a sister who says, I want to put on a niqab. And he says, no, the kuffar. Well, it seems like you don't, uh, it seems like the brother may not really know the ni'mah that Allah Ta'ala uh, has bestowed upon him. And Allah Ta'ala. Inshallah, this is the last written question that I'll read. I'm sorry. Uh, it says here, if you see the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a dream, mm-hmm. 
if you see if you see the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a dream, is it true that your reckoning on the day of judgment will be easy, and that you will be you will not be tortured in the grave? Is this any significance? لا دليل عليه. There's no proof of that. About what the Prophet is innocent of? Well, concerning the sins, we don't see the sins as taking people outside of Al-Islam. Unless that the people say that it's halal to do those sins. But there are certain sins that are from the major sins, and at that particular point, uh, you will not be from the people of Islam. But not that you are kafir, like making zina. La yazni azani, hina yazni. Wa huwa mu'min. The person does not make zina while he's making zina as a mu'min. At that time, he is out there. Not as a kafir. Understand? Also, from uh, those examples are clearly people who fall into shirk in its manifestations like the riya and those other things. Leaving off, leaving off of the prayer whether leaves it off, kafir, beating up the Muslims, killing the Muslims, kufr, all of those things. So all of those are from the major sins, but the thing that we were trying to prove is, they can be major or they can be minor. We just chose that particular hadith of Rulayfa, just to show that it can be a small thing that a person does, who the Prophet Sallallahu freed himself of that individual because of his action. It was a brother here, Ma'amir. Now, now most people say that Jibril gave the wahi to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was supposed to give it to Ali and Rabi Allahu anhu so when they make the tasneem they say khana 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 amana that's a concept of disbelief the rafida a kuffar khumaini is a kafir those ideas that they have a kufr disbelief clear proven kufr the ulama of those people are clearly kufar as for the regular people Allahu alam Allahu alam the ulama kufar they know as for the regular people Allahu alam there are certain Shiite who are from the fold of Islam like the Zaydiyya who are from and Yemen and there are those other type of Shia who are gone outside of Islam and Nusayriya who believe that Ali was Allah incarnate al Quranata. most people like that they still have a lot of different Shiites on the scene al Ibadiyya, the Khawarij today you find them in Bahrain and in Qatar and other places like that but we're not going to put them outside of the realm of al Islam until the argument is established upon them and the Ulama are the ones who do that uh, inshallah ta'ala there's a written question before I take your question if you don't mind Akhi. inshallah it says here do you know that word? when did the marujia marujia? no when did the marujia come into existence and who are they? those marujia people are the people who just basically say al irja in Arabic means a ta'khir they say that the actions are not part of your iman that you can believe 
without doing any righteous deeds. They came into existence and right at the end of the second century in Al Islam and that's their belief that the Fir'aun is a believer before he died he took the Shahada and he said he believed in the Lord of Musa so he doesn't have to do any action so you can do whatever you want and that's what their beliefs are now we find it strange today that the Ahlul Guru and Al Ifraq Rahamakallah it's not possible Ikhwan that someone like me or someone similar to me you can make class can graduate from the University of Medina or anywhere else for that matter Al Azhar or in Mecca or in Riyadh or anywhere you come to America or to England and you start giving dawah and then you start hearing people like me saying this scholar is a kafir or this scholar doesn't know Islam as soon as you see someone like that doing that someone like me she knows his mind is gone literally he's crazy he's maghroor binatsi he's drunk he's too impressed with himself it's impossible we haven't been exposed except to the keys of knowledge and the majority of the brothers who study they have baby libraries they don't even know books the majority they just had an opportunity that Allah afforded them that he didn't give you guys there may be some brothers from amongst you who have more ijtihad more better study habits had you gone to Medina you could have been a better student so we find many of the brothers they study and they graduated from the University of Riyadh now they come now in England and they say that the ulama are from the murji'a why do they call them from the murji'a? they say that the ulama are from the murji'a because they don't make takfir of the leaders, the hukam as if the ulama have to make the inkar on the hukam in front of you people if you don't know that they're doing it, they're not doing it what kind of stuff is that? I'll take that same principle and make you people kafar. That same principle, if I see any of your wives, any of your children, anyone doing something wrong, I say, sis, I didn't see you teaching them and making inkar the Amr bin Ma'roof and the Nahl al Munkar, you are a kafir or you are a murji'a. When did it become from the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, to make the inkar on people in front of other people, especially the hakim, the ruler? So now we have those young brothers, unfortunately, who can't even speak Arabic. Wallahi, when the Sheikh, when the Sheikh Salim al Hilali came over to England to visit us, we were driving on a three hour trip from London to Birmingham. And we had one of the tapes of a brother, this brother. And they put the tape in of a khutbah that he gave in Arabic. And the khutbah was given to brothers from Algeria and brothers from uh, Morocco, from this area, they were the ones who were part of his dawah. And we listened to him as a khatib. Even those oppressive leaders from Bani Umayya and from the Abbasid period, like Mirwan ibn al-Hakam and those people, even as Hajjaj, if you were to read Sir Alam al by al Imam al Zahidi when he start talking about him he say وَكَانَ خَطِيبٌ مُثَوَّهَ he was a serious khatib so the Arabs had this thing where you can appreciate someone has the ability to give a khutbah like the Sheikh Muhammad Hassan I don't think there's a better khatib in Houston right now like him he can give a khutbah akhi wallahi this guy gave a khutbah, you listened to his Arabic and the way he was talking and the way his ideas were all over the place. I was embarrassed for him. I was embarrassed for him and I hate him for Allah's sake. But I was embarrassed that he was making a spectacle of himself. And yet he turns around and he says, this sheikh is a murji. He's from the murji and he's from the murji and he's a kafir and he's a kafir. And then stranger than that is people who have knowledge and they have they should know better 
They have knowledge because they are Arabs and they get doctor's degree and they study in Umul Qura in Mecca and they from the people of Mecca. They have knowledge. But when we have young brothers like ourselves raising other young people up from the students of knowledge, we begin we become maghroor. They write a book and their doctors, their thesis is Al Irja about this issue. Al Irja, when did it start and how it is today? So he writes in the second volume, in the last chapter, an issue about contemporary Irja. Some manifestations of it right now. And he makes Sheikh Nasser from those people. It's amazing, well, it's an amazing thing. So that's why we say to the brothers, those issues that these people are creating for us, well, we should try to really busy ourselves with trying to learn the Quran, inshallah, memorizing the book of Allah Ta'ala, getting serious as being students of knowledge on this level to the best of our ability, try to get our families in order, try to establish some Islamic schools, just practice Islam while we're here, struggling with the Muslims here in America, and leave those issues so and so is the sheikh, he's in prison unjustly, and da, 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 da. he's the scholar, and that's Kalam Sai. Inshallah Ta'ala, before we conclude, I believe there was one more question. And hey, we have question. a tweet with Abdul Kareem about Al Irja. Yeah. Abdul Kareem, he has a tape about Al Irja, about the Aqidah of the Murji'ah, in the Usul of the Dawah to Salafi, Inshallah. Mm. Jazakumullah khair. The brother, this will be the last question, unfortunately. Uh, afterwards, inshallah, as a small reminder, brothers, please, uh, this uh, hall will not be the hall for the final closing uh, lecture, inshallah ta'ala. It will be in the ballroom where the Arabic lectures are being held, inshallah.